We are about to kick off the Ethereum 1 uh, slash Ethereum 2 transition. And I think that uh, Danny is the right person who will introduce you the topic. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm Danny. Um, I work at the Ethereum Foundation on a lot of A2 stuff. Um, the question of what the existing Ethereum chain does and is in relationship to Ethereum 2.0 has been kind of an open question over the past year as the Ethereum 2.0 protocol has emerged and as people have begun to work on it. Um, for a while, it was um, maybe it would be rolled in as a smart contract within one shard uh, that was also floated. Maybe it just exists in parallel forever and we let it die. Um, both of those, one of those seemed kind of complex and the challenges were not so clear how to solve them and the, and the other, uh, it just letting it exist forever, uh, kind of didn't feel like the, the humanist approach as Casey likes to put it. Um, it didn't, you know, all of these humans in this room work on the Ethereum protocol. Uh, so it's been a priority to figure out a better way to um, slot ETH1 into ETH2. Um, there's a lot of conversations this week around execution, execution environments, and it turns out this like very highly abstracted uh, execution notion of execution um, might allow us to more easily slot ETH1 into ETH2 as its own execution environment. Um, but there's a lot of things to figure out what that actually looks like. Um, and then more importantly, even if you do that, we now have this um, we, we essentially, we have all these developer interfaces on how we interact with the existing Ethereum chain. Um, and one of the big upcoming challenges is how do we take all of these developer interfaces and once we've made this, or prior to making this migration, how do we kind of rework the internals of these, expose very similar, if not the same interfaces, such that the developer experience um, is, is fluid and continuous through that migration. Um, it's definitely the, this is kind of the lay of the land of the problems. It's the technical problem of how, um, how ETH1 becomes an EE if during that transition uh, what, we, what things we might choose to change. There's been talks about changing the Merkle tree structure. Um, how certain things like block difficulty and things like that are translated, some of these old opcodes and things might change. Do you open up the sharded universe to this EE and, and uh, expose new things to Ethereum 1 within Ethereum 2? Um, a number, number of other challenges like that. So it's kind of the, the technical challenges of, of that migration and the, the, the developer layer challenges of uh, masking the complexity and kind of like shifting the entire uh, community over. Um, is that the kind of stuff that we wanted to talk about today? <laughs> okay, cool. Maybe we can start with introducing, let's introduce everyone in the circle briefly, and then uh, we can continue. And, and people are welcome to join the circle as well. Xiao Wei is gonna introduce herself. Okay, it's uh, so it's Xiaowei from Eastern Foundation Research Team, and I've been working for Sharding for a while, and now it's the it's two. Okay, uh, hi, I'm Alex Stokes. I work on Trinity, which is the Python client sponsored by the foundation. Uh, focused on ETH two, I've also been looking into some of the research around the finality gadget, which would be one step where we start to kind of merge the two systems, uh, looking towards a longer term transition. Uh, hello, um, I go by my online tag Proto Lambda. Um, and I've been picking up more and more of the testing work for Ethereum 2 as the spec uh, grows. Um, oh, and the work of the EF. Hi, I'm Adrian Sutton. Uh, I work for Pegasus. Uh, part of consensus, and I've been working on our ETH1 client, which is Besu, and also our Artemis client, which is ETH2. So everyone gets introduced. Everyone gets introduced. Uh, hey, I'm Will. I'm in Quilt. Um, I've been doing phase two research um, and been working on various execution environments and pieces like that. Hi, everyone. Uh, Jacek, coming from Status Research. Uh, we're in this context working on an Ethereum 1 
and an Ethereum 2 client, uh, both up and coming. Hello, my name is Trent. I work with Whiteblock, which is a network protocol testing platform. Hi, my name is Carl, um, Ethereum Research, and uh, I'm mostly working on uh, migrating uh, validators over to ETH2 at the moment. Uh, Okiki, I'm not a researcher. I'm kind of a, just like an angel investor, and I also uh, work for Circle. Hello, my name is Alex, and uh, I work in the Russian Forest and FinTech Association right now, and we are uh, looking at Ethereum from the compliance uh, point of view and developing the software for the national standard cryptography. Uh, hey everyone, my name is Victor. I'm over at Bison Trails. We help people run nodes. And so we currently support um, 1.x. Extremely excited for 2.0 and validation. Hi, my name is Joseph. I am an engineer at GoPax, uh, Korea's cryptocurrency exchange. I'm Hyun, I'm an advisor to GoPax. Hi, uh, I'm Justin Drake, a researcher at the Ethereum Foundation, mostly working on ETH2. Hey, uh, I'm Felix again. Uh, I work on ETH1, so. Uh, <laughs> Jason Carver, uh, working with the Ethereum Foundation on the Trinity client, more on the uh, ETH1 side. Well, I'm Vitalik, you probably know about me because I already introduced myself on the previous panel. <laughs> I think that you just don't need to introduce us. And one other component of this migration uh, that I wanted to mention is that EEs and execution environments, which is the notion of state instead of execution in ETH2, are stateless. Uh, so there are, depending on the EE, you'd have to have some notion of state in a separate piece of software or something like that. So the Ethereum 1 clients then likely become that interface to the ETH1 EE in terms of state uh, and provider state and sync and things like that. So there's also this component of um, how Geth, Parity, Nethermind, Nimbus, things like that, uh, that piece of software integrates into this new stack to provide services to the ETH1 EE. Just start with a very basic question. Um, what can regular users expect from the transition? How would they be impacted in any sense? Um, in the short term, not. Uh, and unless you personally choose to take your 32 Ether and stick it into the deposit contract and start running an Ether node and become a validator. Uh, and, and if you do, then you'll be able to start experiencing the wonderful world of ETH2 early. And if you do not, then um, if you do not, then uh, nothing will happen. Um, eventually, there will be some form of ETH1 to ETH2, um, ETH2 uh, transition. And with the kind of a roadmap, as uh, Danny suggested, of uh, ETH1 transitioning into being an ETH2 execution environment, it's theoretically possible to write the software so that you experience like very close to no disruption at all. Like the, the the two kind of the worst things that might that might happen. One is that the chain might have to like halt for some period of time to make the transition go smoothly to allow the uh, Merkle roots to be recomputed according to like, some more efficient tree structure and so on. And the second thing is, as I mentioned uh, in the previous panel, gas costs for opcodes that touch um, state are going to have to be increased massively, both for ETH2 compatibility reasons and for kind of other scalabil uh, scalability reasons as well. And so some applications might have to kind uh, of you know, change the way that they're implemented in order to continue to be optimal. So in that, and I, I mentioned it explicitly at the beginning, the challenge, and, and a lot of these challenges cannot necessarily be tackled today. Um, the research around phase two, although is progressing quite rapidly, um, especially compared to where we were, say, six months ago, um, we're not at the point where we're interfacing, where we're actually dealing with kind of like the user level and, and developer level interfaces into these things. Um, but when we do cross that road, say, early next year, um, it's going to become extremely valuable and important for the maintainers of 
um, the developer interfaces, the Web3 libraries, the, the developer, all the developer tooling um, to begin to collaborate, to start to um, define these interfaces and kind of like realign these interfaces to plug into ETH2. Um, so early, mid next year, I think forming some sort of group that of people that do work on these toolings to um, kind of get, get ahead of the curve because uh, it's going to be important for migration. I had a question on the shift to proof of stake. Are there any specific um, points in time or really events that are important for this transition in terms of like maintaining the security of the network, uh, if it becomes more secure or less secure at some point, and what the parameters are? Yeah, so the parameters that probably matter are, or the kind of the events that you need to care about. One is the time that the deposit contract gets published, and so if you're a validator, you will be able to kind of pre-join. The other is the time when the chain launches. And you basically, if you're a validator, you should be sure that you have a client um, running at that point. Um, and when the chain launches, like you'll have a proof of stake chain running. Um, the next major milestone after that would be the phase one switch. And the phase one switch is important um, because that's the time when shard chains will turn on. And so that's the time when, especially if you have a lot of ether, your computational requirements will increase. Like because your computational requirements will basically be proportional to the amount of ether you have. The more ether you have, the more validator slots you have, and so the more shard blocks you will be called to uh, make, uh, make a crosslink on. Um, and then after that, and there will continue to be forks, but kind of the general way the chain works will continue to be fairly similar. And, and then after that, of course, the ETH1 to, to ETH2 merge, the details of which haven't been fully figured out yet. Uh, so in that roadmap, we still don't have a way to exit from being mm. a validator. So that's, there's okay, like a that's, significant increase. No, that's, that's a good point. This is something I missed. Um, in phase one or two, not fully, deci not fully decided, ETH will become uh, transferable. The kind of default roadmap is that ETH will become, trans it will become transferable and more and more people just want to have their ETH on the ETH2 side. I mean, if desired, there's also, of course, the alternative of like making an explicit ETH2 back to ETH1 bridge, which, of course, uh, can absolutely be uh, a absolutely be done. But it's something that like is extra work as well. So, mm. yeah, I'm thinking of the scenario where sudden where you buy in in phase zero, mm -hmm. and suddenly you end up with lots of more responsibilities in phase one that you realize that you cannot can no longer support. So first of all, you can withdraw and you can just have your ETH sit, uh, sit there. And when, when transfers are implemented, then uh, you could also just sell your ether to some, to, to some whale or just anyone. <laughs> uh, like, there's probably going to be a bunch of, like basically, if the, like, the thing is, right, that if the price of kind of ETH on the ETH2 side kind of goes below the price of ETH on, on the ETH1 side by even a tiny amount, then everyone who would have joined by joining through the normal process would instead want to join by just trading their ETH1 for a little bit more ETH2 and then joining directly from the ETH2 side. So there's this kind of natural demand pressure that you would be able to, tr to kind of trade into and like you would, uh, in order to convert your ETH2 back into ETH1 side ETH if you want to. And if this natural pressure is, is too weak in practice, then you know it's possible that the beacon ETH will go lower, but then the bigger the price discrepancy, the more of an incentive it is for us as a community to, to build a two-way bridge. So in a way, it's kind of self-healing um, because the possibility of the bridge will re reduce the, the gap. <laughs> the, 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 the suggestion was to commit to doing the bridge and then kick the can down the curb for as long as possible. Um, I, so some of the like, peripheral, peripheral work that we can do to unify these systems and kind of get value out of the systems uh, out, of, out of ETH2 and ETH1, I think the decision on whether to, to actually do this work is probably contingent upon where we're at with ETH2 at any given point. So I, I mean, we can commit to if we, if we need to do it, we'll do it. 
<laughs> but uh, more importantly, I think kind of assessing, it's always like it would detract, it, it, would, it would take work and take effort and take, uh, you know, focus away from shipping ETH2 the more that we kind of encum encumber the two systems together. And we have made a commitment because, like, once we have the native integration, that is a two-way bridge. I guess the question is, do we have something in between, which is a, a, a high latency two-way bridge as opposed to a really fast native integration? A hypothetical question. If it's... If it's going to cause a contentious hard fork on ETH1 to make a bridge from ETH2 back to ETH1, mm -hmm. is is it still something that, that you would... So, okay, the scenario here I'm thinking is that, okay, ETH2 happens and something really bad happens, and a bunch of extra Ether gets created, and then this kind of price discrepancy happens, and there's a demand to make this bridge to return the best to the S chain. So the nice thing about phase zero and one is that it allows us to architect the system, this complex in many respects system in a production context, but without having users yet. So if some underflow happened and we had 20 billion ETH created, we'd likely fix it. Um, be because it's an early system, there's not that many users. The only users are validators, um, and that's one of the that's one of the reasons that transfers aren't enabled necessarily in phase zero. But, but there's a class of bugs where there, there's a class of bugs where it's not explicitly a problem, right? Mm -hmm. That you can have this kind of misaligned incentives or something, and there can be ether created, and some people say, "Oh, this is totally fine. This is part of the protocol." But other people say, "No, this is a serious problem," and it's difficult to tell the difference between the two. Not in a way that would generate a bunch of ether. Um, there are potentially slash like may like if if half of the validator set got slashed, you could see that being very contentious, right? If if it was some sort of like bug in the software and things like that. But ten times the supply of ether being created is like explicitly not an intended portion of the protocol. So, but I I, I hear you. I hear you. Um, the more that you encumber the systems, the more that it becomes more difficult to fork or maneuver one or the other, or the more that politics over here might affect politics over there. Um, yeah. um, I, I have a question. When you're thinking about designing a bridge, how much of your consideration is around the work that it'll take to implement it versus the like social construct of like being bought in and having no way to leave? I, uh, my personal opinion is that like there is part of us. I think like having a social, like having it be two way is somewhat better than not having it be two way. The reason we're not enthu like enthusiastically going toward implementing the bridge on day one is because it legitimately is a lot of, um, a lot of work. And like if it, it and in the happy case, it's work that we, exp that we expect to never need. But I don't know people's people's opinions on this might uh, on this might differ, right? And for better or worse, um, ETH one takes a lot of time and effort to fork and get things in, um, and so the longer that we can operate in ETH two very rapidly um, and, and can iterate quickly, uh, the quicker we can get things out. Um, and kind of get to the vision. The sooner that we choose to tightly couple these systems, the harder it is going to, to be rapidly iterate and get out these phases of, of production. So definitely a trade-off there. I think the other aspect that, that I quite like, and you know, at risk of disagreeing with Vitalik, um, <laughs> is there's a real incentive that people are excited about ETH2 and, and so want to get in and stake. And there's then a real incentive to actually make it work and go all the way and get mainnet over to it if that's the only way you can then really use that ETH that you've just put in. So kind of having it locked up is, is nice. Uh, in some ways, it makes it a little harder to sell people on the idea of becoming a validator. But once you manage to get them over that hump, it's kind of downhill in terms of getting them to support moving forward, which is nice. And if we want to go full do or die, then um, we can change the deposit contract. So instead of locking the ETH forever, it becomes accessible, accessible by the DAO hacker on January 1st, 2027. <laughs> uh, yeah, just given liquidity alone, can't we expect an illiquidity discount on 
the ETH to Ether. And if you're one to one burning your ETH1 Ether and then creating one ETH2, um, yeah, I mean, a decision is made there. And it's based off of how much you're expecting to generate in new ETH2 as being a validator. Um, but it, granted, it's a very complex uh, right right so you might you might expect some sort of discount for some time horizon but if your time horizon is longer than uh that with which the systems are, are merged and unified then you don't really need to necessarily you don't externalize that that discount for the time so i do expect early validators to be hobbyists enthusiasts long-term holders uh, and, and I expect them I expect them to get probably higher return than when these systems are unified and there's more institutional players and and a lot more people kind of willing to accept a, a different risk analysis and so honestly I hope that it's a boon for hobbyists I hope that it's a boon for people that are like deeply invested not just finan financially but like invested in the technology and believers in the technology When, what are the right conditions for the ETH1 folks to look at using the finality gadget, like implementing the finality gadget? Hmm. What was the question, sorry? What are the right conditions for us to start talking about implementing the finality gadget back from the beacon chain to the main chain? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Conditions, uh, technical conditions, or, or yeah, like? Yeah, like, like okay, the, so the beacon it, chain so is good it, enough. What is yeah, good yeah. enough? So, mean? Uh, uh, there's really two things. One is one is um, the technical, and two is um, understanding, like better understanding the time horizon of, of phase, say phase two. If phase two is a hundred years from now, we should implement the finality gadget. If it's two months from now, we probably shouldn't. And then somewhere in between, there's a, there's well, a line. There's, it doesn't have to be like we as in everyone, right? Like a finality gadget could like, the, I think one of the reasons Jason's asking is that is doing the Python clients and Python is um, slower than other languages at executing history. And so if you got a finality gadget, you'll need to check like five hours of history, which is really nice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it could definitely be an op be a kind of optional and of light client uh, t type thing that you can do. Uh, question. So going back to the question about, uh, I guess the the first two phases before, or like a, with regards to building the, I guess either one way or two way bridge between ETH one and two. Um, apologies if this is orthogonal, but. Have, within the risk analysis, have you guys considered, let's say, some centralized exchange just basically say, create or allowing and facilitating and encouraging their customers to basically deposit um, their balances into the, the ETH deposit contract and basically creating this like weird futures um, ETH 2.0 um, like market before there's even like on chain liquidity? And like, have you guys considered that or is that just completely orthogonal to the rollout? I guess, like, actually, one question with that is that, like, if there was a kind of futures market for ETH to ETH, then, like, why would anyone, I guess, like, vo voluntarily participate in that construction? Because, like, if that, if the price is, if the price is lower than one, then you'd see why people would want to buy. But if the price is lower than one, then, like. Why would you even want to kind of move your ETH onto the ETH2 side and lock it up unless you're also going to be a proof of staker? I, mean, I guess, like at some point, I think like transfers on the ETH2 side are going to be enabled, and so like a, a, a price between the two sides is going to exist. And like I do think there will be, I, I do think there will be a lot of uh, pressure to kind of push that price to be very close to or, or equal to the one level. Any other questions? Can you please come over to the front because we have cables and we can like. Um, have there been any considerations of, of like uh, testnet implementations for, for some of the, for, um, for testing the, the ecosystems, whether they're like a deterministic testnet or possibly like a like a confrontational test net where you know it, it, you know actors are incentivized to try to 
um, disrupt the network as much as possible or, or just any any ideas around that front? These things are certainly on the horizon. And after the interop uh, workshop where we we're kind of doing initial interoperability testing, um, that is definitely the next phase. Although some private more scaled out networks um, are probably on the immediate horizon before we open it up. Uh, but I'd certainly like to do some adversarial stuff. Um, I've, I've had a couple of conversations with some guys at Cosmos to hear about their experience over there. Um, for better or worse, we have a lot of clients. So some of the complexities of, of doing that and managing the complexities of many implementations of the software in these public test nets um, going to be interesting. Yeah, I and mean, I think an equivalent to what we did with um, Olympic in 2015 with incentives to dust the hell out of the thing would be great. Hi, my name's Dan. Um, I'm from Coinbase. Hi, Dan. Hey, hey Vitalik. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious what your, what your mindset is around leveraging exchanges and other entities to migrate ETH 1.0 to 2.0 in terms of adoption? I guess like, I mean, the first question is kind of what role exchanges would have, right? Because like, the default process for moving ETH over to become a validator doesn't really require any kind of special third parties. I mean, I guess like, in the case where there are ETH2 people that wants to migrate back to the ETH1 side, and then there's ETH1 people that want to deposit, then you could kind of act as a matchmaker between those groups and create an easy interface for that. Yeah, I certainly expect when transfers are enabled on the Beacon chain for exchanges to kind of step up and, and provide uh, liquidity options to validators um, and kind of expect you all to do that. Are you going to help organize that or just expect us to do I've it? I've talked to people at Coinbase, so. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I don't know, uh, uh, kind of explaining, especially when transfers come into uh, existence, having literature maybe focused uh, for exchanges to better understand what's going on, uh, would it help enable exchanges to enable our users? So, yeah. Thank you. So, oh, okay, sorry. Can, can we expect uh, ETH two ETH to be uh, traded as a separate token? That's the um, that's the exchange's that, decision. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. Like, it's an it's basically an, an exchange decision. Like, we could have exchanges this. Uh, I defer to product people on that. Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. So, sorry, I didn't mean to be like um, blunt, but yeah, if an exchange were to like similar to, I guess BCH for the fork for that, like. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for your answer. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the thing to think about there is ultimately whenever you've got anything that's a deliverable currency, uh, you have to be able to deliver it to the right place. So if, if ETH2 and ETH1 are separate and you can't transfer back, um, then anything doing deliverable trading absolutely has to trade ETH2 as a separate thing to, to ETH1. Um, if it's non-deliverable, you can get more fancy and people in finance like to get fancy. But uh, I won't try and speculate on that. <laughs> Well, uh, I will say one thing about if you look at existing like SAFTs and OTC markets, like there's already like well-established processing guidelines for how people trade these liquid like promises essentially, um, and so it's not out of the question that the same thing would happen for ETH2 as long as some liquidity providers or exchanges were supporting it. So uh, the reason why I asked this question is because I feel like you know from a like regular human standpoint, it would make sense if you know like the transition would be kind of seamless, but. It's clearly not like it is like, you know, like it's 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 also an investment opportunity. And, you know, so there are certain issues there, which I feel like it would be maybe that would be one reason to like go for the bridge like right away. So we wouldn't have this problem even like from a just from a user standpoint, like it would be really clear that like, you know, we would never get into the situation where you kind of like gamble with like ETH1 versus ETH2 on an exchange. So one, instead of right away, another option right there is 
at the moment that transfers are enabled. So anytime, at, at the moment there's liquidity, uh, an option on ETH2, there being a fungibility option. And that's, that's interesting. Um, I think that um, there's many factors at play here. But looking historically, coins like Zill or like what Dai is about to do, <laughs> there's a lot, of, a lot of things going on here. It's hard to predict. But looking at previous coins that have migrated to other blockchains that, that support their old blockchain as well, their new blockchain, such as Zillica and, and Dai, uh, may set precedent for what can happen here or what can't happen here. Um, something that's really interesting coming out of this conversation is at least the people that are speaking, it seems like the biggest concern is value and liquidity and all the questions around the token stuff. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Is that not, <laughs> is that representative of everyone in the room? No. Who cares about value? <laughs> well, I mean, I, you can care about value, but there's, there's a, probably other, th someone said no. Yeah? <laughs> Give him a mic. We want to hear his perspective. So let's but say your name, please. Hey, I'm Barry, and I, I don't think that it's uh, representative of the group. I think that the people who are sitting closer towards the front, self-selected as as like having having some kind of strong motivation to interact in this conversation. Bigger bags. And the, and the, and the strongest motivation, <laughs> a, a very strong motivation, is a financial motivation. <laughs> Except for me, I just sat here by, by accident. <laughs> I will say something that I'm very curious to hear is how much of the work that is being done for ETH 1.x is repeatable. So if we're like pushing back state rent and it'll get implemented, let's say like a year or two from now, like is it an easy drag and drop onto 2.0 or will we have to rehash a lot of the same issues? It's a, I mean, the ETH 2.0 kind of core design is designed around kind of state minimalism, and so state is a kind of somewhat higher level a level concept than consensus. But like basically all of the stateless client work that's happening on the 1.x side is kind of also simultaneously work that prepares ETH 1.x for kind of being a, tr uh, a transplanted into being an uh, into being an execution environment inside of ETH 2. I can also say that from a technical point of view, like uh, a lot of the work that we've been doing is kind of like shared in between, like you know, the clients. I mean, after all, we we do share. Like for example, we are making like the Go-based ETH1 client, and there is like sharing of libraries going on with the ETH2 implementation. So it's not the, the these projects aren't completely separate when it comes to the actual tech. It's more like they are conceptually different, of course, and they do implement different protocols, and they are different products in a way, but the software is, there is a lot of sharing going on. And the same can be said about Trinity, I guess, because it has both. So it does share a, a lot of code. Uh, tacking on to that question, then, like, between ETH1 and 2, we're doing the same thing but changing everything. So we're changing the consensus, we're changing the networking protocol, we're changing the execution environment, uh, and we're changing the cryptography. What do we hold constant? It is money, it is money, um, I mean, the fact that like current applications will continue to uh, work through the through the transition, kind of as is, like modular concerns about opcode repricings, I think is like, one major thing. Hmm. I have a question about uh, clients. So we have what seven clients uh, in development for ETH2. Would there be efficiency to be gained if efficiency to be gained if we had less? client teams and more work being done on getting to the end. And also, a second part of that is, um, if there are seven clients, the performance of the blockchain is going to be held back by the slowest one. So uh, that increases the, the chance that it's not a full performance. Right, so if you could take all of the people working on all the clients and put them on half the clients, maybe so. Uh, these are independent companies and entities uh, that you can't necessarily just do that with. That's just um, a cat herding problem. Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
That said, there's probably diminishing returns after five. Uh, but we've had kind of an, an incredible amount of uh, technical sharing and idea sharing. And, and I think it's actually been a boon to the process in many respects. Um, with the upcoming test nets and move to production, I do have some concerns about managing complexity and managing user expectations on what which software to run. Right? It's, it's hard to know. It's hard to cho choose. Um, and we will have, um, to speak to the second question, um, metrics, minimum set of criteria that to be production ready. So if you can't handle a state transition with um, 4 million validators in under this amount of time, then like you don't get the check in the box. And, and you're probably not ready for production. And that'll be very clear to users. It'd and be so, so much better to have three great clients than seven that maybe not all of them are great. Right, and we probably will have three great clients. Um, and maybe more, but we will certainly have three great clients. So I think we end up in the same spot. Um, last question, please. Uh, I, I was just going to add to that, that one of the problems we see in ETH1 is that um, GEF is, is so popular that we're gradually kind of converging. And a lot of our gas pricing is based on GEF's performance, um, which is good. And GEF's a great client. I, I, you know, um, But one of the advantages of having so many clients initially in ETH2 is it, is it helps us avoid that centralization. So we do are much more likely to stay with a good broad range of clients with a broad range of approaches to solving problems. Yeah, um, I'm really hoping that. Um we don't have any client with over 50% of the network. I think that's really valuable to the, the security of the network. And I, we will see how many actually launch with phase zero as production ready. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. But we saw, uh, the, we saw the problem with ETH1 that, that a minority client managed to slow down the network uh, until it Well, in ETH1, we also saw that a minority net client managed to speed up the network, right? Like when the, the uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a particular instance, yeah. Yes in a particular very important instance that would otherwise have killed us.